All right, everyone, I think we'll get started. Uh, uh, I'm Nick Vlietstra uh, from uh, Dorsey's Finance and Restructuring Department, and I'm here to introduce um, today's roundtable topic and the speaker, Tom Scanlon. Our topic today is regulatory sandboxes for innovation in financial products and services. And our speaker is uh, Tom Scanlon. Tom is a very recent addition to Dorsey and our finance and restructuring uh, practice group. And he works out of our Washington, uh, D.C. office. Uh, so this is Tom, not only Tom's first time speaking at a bank council roundtable, it's his first time, I think, in attendance at a, one of our bank council uh, roundtables. So I want to tell you a little bit about Tom. Tom's practice covers a range of bank regulatory and payment system issues in addition to advising banks. Tom also devotes significant time to advising fintech companies on products and compliance with federal and state law. He is also active in helping clients shape public policy in the financial regulation uh, arena, including drafting legislative proposals and prefer preparing comment letters on uh, proposed rules. Tom has extensive experience advising on issues that involve the Federal Reserve's regulations, the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, the National Bank Act, the Electronic Fund Transfer Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Military Lending Act, um, privacy, financial data aggregation, and vendor management standards, uh, just to name a few. In addition to his work in private practice, it might interest you to know that Tom has significant government legal experience as well, uh, including serving at the Federal Reserve Board and also at the Department of Treasury. And while he was at Treasury, Tom had the distinction, one of many distinctions was working as the principal attorney for the Treasury team that drafted um, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Act of 2010, which is near and dear to all our near and dear hearts. Our so hearts. with that, uh, let me hand it over to Tom. Thanks for coming. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to those of you here in Minneapolis, and good afternoon to all of you also on the telephone. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to all of you and to go into a subject that is emerging and should be provocative for a wide range of financial institutions and service providers that aim to help those financial institutions. Uh, our subject today is the regulatory sandbox. and how the regulatory sandbox programs have been designed to help promote innovation in financial products and services. I'll give you an idea about how I've allowed for our time this afternoon. I'd like to speak about some of the initiatives by the banking agencies and uh, in a variety of dimensions to provide some context for what innovation might mean for financial products and services and for the regulatory environment. And then highlight one sandbox initiative in particular uh, from the UK, uh, from the Financial Conduct Authority. And then the balance of the hour, I plan to discuss the particular requirements and the proposals issued by the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection. And one program that is up and running in the state of Arizona from the Office of the Attorney General there. Uh, towards the end, we'll uh, provide some headlines about what to look out for in the future in this area. And at any time, of course, you should uh, raise questions and, and have more of a, of a dialogue. Uh, I'd appreciate that. So a sandbox, of course, is uh, the type of environment that each of us should be familiar with, right, from childhood. Go play and uh, in my best memory is thinking about the big concrete wall that surrounded the sandbox in the school where I grew up. Thought to myself, Tom, don't clunk your head on that concrete wall. And I think that that's where financial institutions, fintech companies might find themselves with these regulatory sandboxes as well. Throughout the hour, I'm going to refer simply as a matter of convenience to a fintech company but the initiatives that are the subject of the, the sandboxes really are open to a wide range of companies. And I'll get to that item at the end as well. well what about innovation? The federal banking agencies have launched a series of initiatives all aimed at innovation and various dimensions of innovation. Of course, the, uh, 
the bulk of the requirements that financial institutions encounter and that service providers that help those financial institutions also encounter relate to operating a bank in a manner that is conforms to the safety and soundness standards. And so what the banking agencies talk about then in terms of innovation is acting in a manner that's responsible. And it shouldn't surprise us as well that most of the innovation that the agencies are looking out towards are innovations in the realm of consumer financial products and services that might not seem obvious uh, since there's so much other technological advance uh, advancements in other areas of financial products and services. But of course, the obvious factor here is the smartphone. The smartphone has completely remade access to a deposit account or to a credit card for an ordinary consumer. And the other dimension of, of innovation that has attracted the attention of several of the regulatory agencies is the idea that through technological accomplishment, there could be greater financial inclusion. What might that mean? Uh, there are a wide range of definitions for financial inclusion, and those definitions vary depending upon the geography or the product type, right? Deposit accounts or prepaid accounts or credit products, closed end or open end. A general definition that I find to be helpful is one offered recently by the Federal Reserve's Vice Chairman for Supervision, which is that Financial inclusion is the initiative or the drive to address or to remedy unequal or insufficient access to financial products or services. And the omission of consumer financial products and services, I believe, is, is uh, intentional because the Federal Reserve, of course, is looking out for credit availability for small businesses as well. Um, likewise, the F FDIC chairman has noted that financial inclusion could have a clear objective, which is to get more financial products and services that are delivered through the banking system into the households that currently are not banked, the so-called unbanked individuals, or those who are classified by the FDIC as underbanked. And that is the, the experience in which a consumer might use a deposit account or have a prepaid care, a card by virtue of, say, an employer, but otherwise rely upon some other financial intermediary that is outside the banking system. Uh, technology is a way forward for this, and so innovation is, is uh, become a centerpiece for policy from the, from the board. Uh, in the wholesale markets, we see the drive toward innovation and the payment system improvement initiative. The FDIC, uh, over the last few weeks, few weeks, a few months, has actually announced, but not yet launched, an Office of Innovation. And even the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, uh, a place that I personally find to be uh, bewildering, uh, a, though I've served in the Department of the Treasury, even FinCEN is on board with the idea that there could be innovative approaches to work with the requirements under the Bank Secrecy Act and other anti-money laundering standards. One big initiative that is all around the idea of innovation is uh, launched by the Office of the Controller of the Currency. And there is an Office of Innovation it staffed. Um, there is a, a big initiative at the OCC to accept a application from a fintech company to apply to be a special purpose national bank. And the driving force from that initiative is this concept, again, of responsible innovation. Here, the OCC describes this as the use of new or improved financial products, services, and processes to meet the evolving needs of consumers, businesses, and communities in a manner that's consistent with sound risk management and aligned with the bank's overall business strategy. And the part about this definition for responsible innovation that strikes me is the omission of safety and soundness standards, or even the jargon of safety and soundness. It, the bank's sound risk, mo risk management practices and the bank's own overall business strategy 
appear at the center point of the OCC's definition of what is responsible. And the terms by which the OCC might hold a bank accountable for being irresponsible, those are relatively undefined. But the initiative, I think, is, is uh, clear, and that is that the OCC wants to encourage fintech companies and other service providers to be engaged in the banking system and, most optimistically, to apply to the OCC to be licensed as a national bank, as a special purpose bank. Uh, just to point out a few aspects of that as well, and we can draw attention to this when we see some of the other regulatory sandbox programs, the OCC's initiative is centered on what already exists in the OCC's rules, is defined as the core banking activities. There are three core banking activities, but the activity of taking deposits now has been classified to, uh, in a manner that if an applicant aims to have a bank that takes deposits, then the OCC has stated that the path forward for that applicant is to become a full service national bank, leaving then for the special purpose national bank the opportunity to obtain a national bank charter principally by conducting activities that are related to the core activity of either paying checks or lending money. I think mostly through the process of initiating payments, acting as a money transmitter without actually having the custody of funds or uh, you know, having the, the liability for the funds in the manner of a deposit account. So there is an obligation to pay out, um, but not a capacity to act as the store of value for funds. Now, most people are focused on the core activity of lending money, but uh, the question raised in the room here this afternoon, and for those of you on the phone, the question was how uh, does the bank operate to pay checks if not taking deposits? And, the, and that's related mostly to the action of serving as a money transmitter. Uh, either activity, serving as a money transmitter or lending money, could promote the objective of financial inclusion, particularly if we think about the, the FDIC's observation about consumers who have some access to the banking system but otherwise rely upon other non-bank participants in order to effect payments. This opportunity then to be licensed by the OCC is a, is a big deal, and I've highlighted this because this really does set up what the regulatory sandbox is in part aimed to accomplish. The states, of course, are not left out of the process of modernizing regulatory systems and requirements in light of seeking greater innovation and investments in technology by banks and non-bank entities. A few years ago, this Conference of State Bank Supervisors in, launched what it refers to as its Vision 2020 initiative. And that initiative contains six elements here as displayed on the, on the slide. The, um, the important point about the state a state-based initiative and the initiative that's coordinated through the CSBS is that for a fintech company that is seeking to engage in money transmission activities or as a licensed lender, the process of seeking licensure amounts to going to each state and filing separately the papers and submitting the fee and responding to the questions that each state banking agency may present to the applicant. Uh, to a fintech company that is trying to get its product up off the ground and learn for itself whether there are any even going to be any customers out there, whether there's going to be a business, that process of obtaining licenses in multiple jurisdictions is, as we can imagine, quite cumbersome. And for a fintech company whose perceives its, its platform to be the internet 
where a consumer can reside in any place, and even as a practical matter, reside in one state and then soon after move to another state, the process of obtaining a license in one state and then having to drop that customer because he or she moves to a different state, that seems to be a complete waste of investment. The states, of course, recognize this, this logjam, and without giving up at all any of the prerogatives of acting as the authority to issue a license, are seeking then what I refer to as a second order solution of trying to modernize the coordination among the state regulatory agencies for banks and non-bank entities alike. So what does this have to do with the sandbox? Well, the sandbox really is an opportunity for a regulatory agency to provide a place for a fintech company to play, or play but not play for keeps, and develop this technology to the point that uh, regulators or investors or consumers can re appreciate is real and actually functions. One uh, place where the regulatory sandbox has taken hold and the, the place that's been most commented on by policymakers in the United States is the innovation hub founded by the UK's Financial Conduct Authority. And the FCA, in a report issued in 2015, observed that the, the need for the sandbox is driven really by its perception that the uncertainty around what the rules actually would require creates a delay, and that that delay disproportionately affects first movers and other participants who are going to foster innovative technologies that could serve financial products and services. The risk that the FCI identified is that the innovation might be abandoned, or at least abandoned for financial products and services, if there's not a clear path to getting through the regulatory requirement. The FCA also appreciated in its report that even for a licensed banking organization, the regulatory sandbox could prove to be helpful because for a fintech company that is acting as a service provider and offering a new type of technology, if the FCA had some awareness about how the technology works in the controlled environment, the test environment that is the sandbox, then the authorized banking organization would have a clearer path to address any questions that an examiner could raise about why is this bank doing business with this fintech provider that is engaged in this, uh, this activity that is perceived to be risky. The way that the regulatory sandbox has, was designed in the UK, and this is a, a general overview, there are lots of details in the applications that I'll set aside for now, but the general plan was for the FCA to allow a fintech company to go forward as authorized, but authorized with restrictions, and then once the firm moved through the program with its test, then the FCA would relieve the firm of its restrictions and permit the fintech company to go live with full regulatory um, authorization. That is, the restrictions would be lifted. The restrictions on getting into the sandbox then were that the product or service, the innovation that the firm fintech offered had to be designed for financial services industry. I don't know exactly what that means, except perhaps that the, the UK is trying to draw a boundary around the way that the innovation or the technology is tailored for financial services and not generally applicable for other commercial uses, and that there needs to be a test of a new product. And the thinking here is that if the product is duplicative of what some banks already do in the marketplace, well, then the solution for the fintech company is to apply to obtain the appropriate license. It's a money transmitter or it's an e-money issuer or as a bank. The, uh, that type of construct then has, uh, has led to this idea that the sandbox is fit for a firm that is offering what the UK calls, uh, FCA calls, a genuine innovation, a new solution that's novel, or significantly different at least, than what banks already offer. And the practical constraint on the FCA is what the other member states of the EU would 
be permitted to allow under the EU's general law. The, the important aspect of this from the perspective of those of us here in the United States, and particularly for the federal banking agencies and the state banking agencies, is that the program that the FCA launched actually worked. Dozens and dozens of fintech companies, as well as authorized banks, filed applications and were admitted into the program in, in waves. Uh, I've listed a few of these on this slide. Some might appear to some of us as not exactly offering genuine innovation, but the technology linked to the product or service that's not commonplace seems, at least to me, to be sufficiently dif uh, different than what an existing offering is. The, um, the travel tool, for example, seems to be obvious, except that when a consumer really is in an airport and needs the travel insurance and access to the funds to make a claim in order to make a connecting flight to some faraway place, and he or she's going to be gone on 11 hours, then getting the claim paid through an automated system might be a good idea, as opposed to waiting around for four or five days until the the luggage doesn't show up in the destination. The advisory tool to help the consumer lower the cost of the existing debt, that seems not to be so new. Why couldn't a consumer simply compare the cost of the offering? Say what we have here in the United States is a balanced transfer, but providing some routinized or standardized way for the consumer to assess that uh, cost process or that cost assessment might be helpful and so forth. So the three programs that we have in the United States then are two are proposed uh, by the Bureau and one is underway by the Attorney General in Arizona. We'll start with the Bureau's proposals that were issued in 2018. One is the Disclosure Sandbox that focuses on disclosures and the other initiative announced in December is broader, uh, identified by the Bureau as the Product Sandbox. The Bureau described in its 2013, or its 2013 policy that was aimed for promoting trial disclosures to be a failure, uh, primarily because so few companies came forward to offer new approaches for making disclosures, either through the language or the format or the delivery mechanism. And the absence of any applicants led the, the new leadership at the Bureau to believe that the prior policy had failed, thus the, the new disclosure sandbox. The disclosure sandbox doesn't come from no place. The disclosure sandbox comes from section 1032E of the Consumer Financial Protection Act of 2010. Subsection A of this section authorizes the Bureau to create a model disclosure for any type of consumer financial product or service and instructs the Bureau to test the model disclosure and permits the Bureau to shape the manner of the test or to shape the terms and conditions upon which the new model disclosure might be used by a covered person or by a covered person and a service provider jointly. And this subsection 1032E then goes one step further and, per, and permits the Bureau to authorize a trial program limited in time and scope whereby a fintech company can try to develop a new disclosure to, prove, to improve upon an existing disclosure. The program is tailored towards a model form and that's because the idea is that if the model form already allows for a safe harbor, then perhaps there's a new approach that could be taken, either in the language that could be substituted in the model form or with the format or with the method of delivery that could be equally effective particularly in the channel in which the consumer financial product or service is being delivered. The Bureau has a broad discretion under the law to tailor the standards and procedures for the particular program. And the Bureau has taken advantage of this leverage in making its uh, 
its disclosure sandbox fairly flexible. The practical advantage to a covered person for entering into the sandbox is the opportunity to obtain a waiver. And by that, the Bureau means that there could be a safe harbor provided to that covered person that if the disclosure is given in a certain manner and the fintech company adheres to the standards and conditions that the Bureau prescribes, that there shall be uh, no liability for a violation of the underlying statutory or regular requirement to give the disclosure, or an outright exemption. And f I, the distinction might be slim, but one way to think about what the Bureau is driving towards is that perhaps there's some element in the model disclosure that must be adhered to, this simply just would go away. There wouldn't be no new approach to doing that. We just don't do that. The, the provocative aspect of Section 1032E and what the Bureau is proposing following that statutory authorization is that the relief may be granted to any requirement under any enumerated consumer law. And there are, there's a dozen of those. So think about the different types of disclosures that must be provided under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act or the Electronic Fund Transfer Act right, for a money transmitter or for a lender. The opportunity for a fintech company then to go forward here in the, in the Bureau's program is to uh, relieve that requirement, allow this, this new method of delivering that service to, to be more effective. The policy that the Bureau announced contains six parts. It's fairly straightforward. There needs to be an application. Then the Bureau is going to assess what's going on in the application. The Bureau has prescribed for itself some procedures about how to actually go about issuing the waiver to the fintech company. And one new part about the Bureau's program here is that there already is contemplated that even if there will be a limited time and scope as required under the statute, that the Bureau contemplates that perhaps the test will uh, not disclose enough data and a longer period of time might be necessary to see if the new method of delivery or the new language really is effective. There is a policy in place or proposed to uh, allow the Bureau to coordinate with other regulators. And then most importantly, from uh, the perspective of those of us who work with financial institutions, and for those of you on the phone who are actually in the financial institutions, it's what's the Bureau going to do when someone comes to ask about who's in the program? What's being tested? How much information will the Bureau publicly disclose about the FinTech company that's operating in the disclosure sandbox? That's laid out in sex, Section F of the Bureau's policy. As far as the application goes, uh, I've identified what I believe to be the key elements, the description of how the new disclosure really is going to work, or whether the language and format is going to be delivered in a manner that really is just a new method of delivery. Plus, the applicant needs to describe what the expectation is for improving the disclosure. That's coupled with the requirement to collect data and to describe to the Bureau how the data will be analyzed in order to measure whether the test is successful or not. One point of departure here in the 2018 proposal relative to the Bureau's current policy is that the metrics for improvements do not need to be measured solely in terms of the benefits to the consumers who are supposed to receive the required disclosure. Instead, the improvements really can just go to the savings of the covered person's cost. And that's a big deal, right? If you think about the overall mission of the Bureau and what a model disclosure is supposed to do. But where the Bureau grants some leverage there, the Bureau recognizes, well, we can't go so far with that applicant still needs to address what the potential risks might be to consumers, even when the covered person is saving all this money. So when the Bureau acts on an application, the process of approving that application, admitting the fintech company to the sandbox, granting the waiver, is to then specify some parameters around 
that program. The test populations of the consumers here is going to be one important component because that's going to be the population of consumers about whom the metrics will apply. And the Bureau will include in its approval letter then the Bureau's exercise of its own discretion to take no action for enforcement or other supervisory action, including potentially for a potential violation of committing an unfair, deceptive, or abusive act or practice when using the trial disclosure during the waiver period. With, uh, with the approval letter issued, there nevertheless is a way for the Bureau to take steps and intervene if the test is going sideways, and that's through the process of simply revoking the waiver. But even here, the Bureau is, is already anticipating that that process is going to get messy and establish for itself some parameters so that the fintech company is not left totally stuck. The Bureau then is going to allow the fintech company to come back and respond to the letter of revocation, and even to allow the fintech company to take a step in the middle of the test to cure the apparent defect. Right. The, the question raised in, in the room here is whether there's any sense about how expensive this process might be, how time consuming this might be, what the Bureau might expect in terms of receiving a complete application, and what the FinTech company might expect in terms of the Bureau acting on the, on the application. The, the last part of that of, of that cost parameter is most explicitly addressed in the proposal, and that's that the Bureau expects to act within 60 days. But 60 days from when? Uh, 60 days probably from when a completed application is deemed to have been filed. And as all of us know from other contexts, what is complete in terms of an application is the judgment of the regulatory agency. So the Bureau has posted on its site the process, which starts by saying, come talk to us first. And when I read that, I had the same question. How much is this going to cost us? If we have to come in and chat first, then does that mean we need to have a series of follow-up conference calls, maybe a mock-up of what the disclosure is? I don't know how many iterations of the mock-up language or of the format or of the sandbox that needs to be established in order to get into the sandbox to show how the method of delivery is going to operate. But I think the costs could run moderate. No, I wouldn't say high. Uh, the process overall, I would expect to be four months at a minimum uh, from initial discussion to final approval. But if a fintech company were to complete the process by six months, I would classify that as success. So in terms of the speed of delivering a new product, right? what does that mean? That means that the, that the marketing team and the other components of the business stand by for the sandbox to operate right? in order for the regulatory requirement to be relieved. Correct. The, the question is whether or not the, the cost would be amplified by the requirement to s collect data and to submit data to the Bureau, and I agree with that. The cost would be amplified. One way that advocates from the consumers might think about that so-called cost, though, is that a financial institution, licensed or not, should be ready to respond to complaints from consumers. And one way to, to figure out whether the complaint is warranted or whether the product is working as designed is to collect data. So perhaps the Bureau and its staff, or the, at least the consumer advocates, would believe that that cost is latent in product development cycle. 
I think that's not correct. I think that here we have an explicit requirement to collect data for the program. So over and above whatever the company was inclined to do, that is a cost, a regulatory cost. So among uh, the two dozen or so comments that have been submitted to the Bureau, I pulled one from the CSBS. And restate in what appears to be a paragraph, it's a, just a few sentences, but this is a mouthful. And what the CSBS is trying to communicate to the Bureau is the unsteady place where, at least from the perspective of the CSBS, trying to represent multiple state banking regulatory agencies, is that some states are supporting these types of initiatives and want to encourage innovation by fintech companies to come forward, especially for non-bank institutions. Other states, not so sure. Some states outright opposed as a matter of policy. What the Bureau should be trying to accomplish, the CSPS urges, is to is develop a policy that's sufficiently clear so that there are not unrealistic expectations. And I think that that's a, an interesting posture to take because the unrealistic expectations cuts from the place from the regulatory agencies, the state bank regulatory agencies, is the disclosure lawfully, uh, uh, is, the, is the disclosure permitted? If so, what are the terms and conditions? And the follow-on issue then is how likely is that new method of delivery or that new language likely to stay as permissible for the underlying regulatory requirement? If there's not clarity around that policy, then what the CSBS is drawing attention to is confusion, which is what fintech companies claim we have now by virtue of the differences in state law, setting aside the issues from federal law. The second sandbox that the Bureau has proposed is more adventuresome. This is the product sandbox. And here the, the idea is, is quite different. Whereas the disclosure sandbox really is targeted towards the improvement upon an existing disclosure fitted towards satisfying an underlying regulatory requirement, this sandbox is driving toward developing a new consumer financial product or service or some part of that consumer financial product or service that sets aside a requirement of existing law. Where did the Bureau get this idea? Apparently, the Bureau surveyed the authorities embedded within the enumerated consumer laws and discovered that there are several provisions, but just a few here, uh, in these three laws, the Truth and Lending Act, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, or the Electronic Fund Transfer Act, that appear to provide some route for a covered person to obtain an exemption for an apparent violation of existing law. So the Bureau has described that what the product sandbox would do would allow the fintech company to obtain an approval from the Bureau or an exemption. And if there is going to be an exemption, the exemption might be issued from a statutory provision or from a regulatory provision. The, the layering of these elements appears to be confusing, but the, but the main objective is that this is fairly targeted to these three laws and to the Bureau's authorities that might allow some degree of latitude for an exemption to be applied, at least temporarily, while the test is underway. When the Bureau issues the relief, then the letter that goes to the fintech company will describe what that relief is and will also stipulate that the fintech company must adhere in good faith to the specified terms and conditions. And from my perspective, those are the rails. That's the concrete wall around the sandbox. So the policy that the Bureau established or is seeking to establish is similar to what we say in the layout of the disclosure sandbox. Here, where there's uh, one additional item. But the process is fairly straightforward, as you can imagine. There's the description of the type of relief available, and then the procedures that are going to be applied to uh, 
consider, file an application and to consider the application and the boundaries around which the Bureau may act. For the applicant to go forward, a handful of items are necessary, I think approximately 10 or 11. Uh, these are three that I find to be interesting. And the, here, the explanation of the potential benefits is more explicit. Uh, it's coupled with the, the need to collect data and metrics. And then the applicant also must describe the specific statutory provision or the regulation that, that is creating the burden or that is interfering with the delivery of this novel product or service in some way. And the route through which the Bureau might address some relief. When the Bureau issues the order to grant the relief then, the relief will be limited to the described aspects of the product or service. And that's uh, f fairly intuitive, right? That, the, that what the fintech company is permitted to do on a temporary basis is to perform this function in the sandbox, but not obtain wholesale relief from, say, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. The trade-off for obtaining some temporary relief is that the fintech company needs to report about what's going on, uh, including the complaint patterns and the default rates, for example, in the context of lending products, so that the Bureau can make its own assessment about the potential harms to consumers. The Bureau plans also to describe in its order the extent to which information about the fintech company or the trial program will be publicly available. And I think this is actually the trickiest part of, of this product sandbox because the opportunity for a non-supervised entity to obtain relief from the Bureau and to keep information about that guarded under an exemption of the Freedom of Information Act could be rather complicated. And then the other element of the terms and conditions order that the Bureau would issue then would describe how the Bureau would revoke the relief if necessary, except that the Bureau has states in its proposed policy that the Bureau would not pursue an action to impose retroactive liability on the FinTech company that, for actions undertaken during the sandbox period. This has caused a fair outcry in some quarters, and particularly from state's attorney general, who believe that this process is a non-starter under the laws that the Bureau has identified. And the, the thrust of the comment letter from the 22 state's attorneys, attorneys general is that what the Bureau is really trying to promote through innovation is sloppy rulemaking. The safe harbor provisions that are cited by the Bureau in its proposal don't operate the way that the Bureau has described those provisions. Instead, the state attorneys general state that those provisions were aimed towards a financial institution that looking at a requirement and undertaking an initiative to comply with the stated rule, commit some variance, is involved in an action by the consumer or by the customer, and facing that action can then claim relief for its good faith compliance for what the law would allow or arguably would admit. And the Bureau, so the states allege, has flipped that to take that opportunity to take an affirmative defense as an opportunity for the regulatory agency to provide relief going forward. In Arizona, the regulatory sandbox is targeted towards three different activities, banking, the business of operating as a sales finance company, or invest, uh, engaging in investment advisory services. And what's most interesting here from my perspective is that state regulatory agencies that, re that operate in the area of financial products and services, when you first think of them, the, the biggest type of agency is insurance. But insurance is not admitted in the program 
supervised by the Attorney General. Go figure. Need an innovation for auto insurance? Stand by. Insurance companies will help you with that, but in a regulated way. You need help with a banking product or acting as a money transmitter? We've got that covered. The, the general design of the Sandbox program in Arizona is that a fintech company that wants to do business in Arizona but is unsure about its model or the, some of the profitability metrics, et cetera, may apply, get the product up and running. The number of consumers who reside in Arizona will be fairly um, managed and must fit within the statutory constraint. There's going to be some oversight by the Attorney General's office. And if the test really works, then the fintech company is driven forward towards the licensure process. But if the test fails, then the fintech company needs to have a plan. And the law is clear on this point. So one interesting aspect about the Arizona program is that the fintech company needs to build in, and going back to the issue of cost, the timetable, the internal work of collecting data, and demonstrating that the, that the data fits the test, accounting for success or not. And in this case, when there is no success, actually having a mitigation strategy, which I understand to be if a consumer is deprived of the benefit of the underlying law, then there needs to be some payment made to the consumer to make him or her whole for trying it out. Arizona defines in the law the, the concept of innovation. And here it's that the, it's the use of existing technology to address a problem, provide a benefit, or otherwise offer a product that's not known by the attorney general, which I, makes me laugh a bit. Like, well, suppose the attorney general doesn't get out much and is only you know, living in the western part of the United States. Uh, perhaps other innovations are, are more widely known in the Pacific Northwest. But setting aside um, that aspect of the definition, the, the important point here is that there, there needs to be some demonstration that the newness is relative to whether or not the technology or the application of the technology is widespread by other financial institutions. Each application needs to offer the innovation. In other words, the applicant is apparently not permitted to tie together a couple of new innovative aspects of a financial product or service. Or if the applicant does so, probably needs to roll that up into some cumulative effect to show that taken all together, this new financial product is not widespread. The relief that's afforded here is that the, the applicant is not going to be subject to Arizona law, particularly the law that would require the entity to be licensed in order to offer that financial product or service to a consumer in Arizona. But those provisions that grant that relief also contain certain clawback provisions. And this is most notable for the investment advisory activity so that the fintech company that's offering investment advisory services need to offer certain disclosures. There needs to be some baseline standard of serving the consumer who's the potential investor and not completely getting him or her off track relative to how a registered investment advisor in the state would be required to do so. And there's no relief for the fintech company under the Arizona Consumer Fraud Act. In this regard, then, the, the application must describe how the fintech company is not able to go forward with its product or service in Arizona without the help of the test environment. And that's kind of interesting. Not able to proceed. Well, what's, what's uh, creating the barrier for the fintech company to prepare the application to be licensed and meet the existing requirements. We'll have to see how that really shakes out in the experiences from the Office of the Attorney General. I'm not 
sure exactly how an applicant would satisfy this requirement of, of describing how the existing requirements for obtaining a license are too onerous or ill-suited for the innovation that's being offered. But the Arizona uh, Attorney General's Office has tried to soften this a bit by stating that when an application is submitted, the office will evaluate the application holistically to assess whether the test is appropriate and worthwhile to conduct. Record keeping is a part of the process. That shouldn't uh, surprise us. And the data and the records really do serve, at least indirectly, oversight by the Attorney General's Office to satisfy itself that the FinTech company is not offering the product in a way that's so at variance with the underlying requirements of the law that some consumer might be at risk. So among these three programs, there are some common themes. The first is the novelty of the technology as applied to the financial product or service, and in this case, to the consumer financial product or service. The way that I think about the requirement for novelty is that the general principle is that a fintech company doesn't get a pass on a requirement of law unless there really is some innovation that offers a benefit in some capacity. Now, we've seen the Bureau has described the benefit in terms of cost savings as well, but more practically in terms of the bottom line result to the consumer. In order to create the latitude to grant that waiver, the fintech company really needs to come through and to track the way that the test is going. I think that this is the most interesting part in terms of getting the rules to be changed because if a fintech company gets through the process of say the disclosure sandbox for the bureau, the test should show all of us that the rule is uh, ill-suited to what the disclosure could otherwise do and should be reformed so that all types of financial institutions could take advantage of a new approach to offering a required disclosure. And the other common theme then is that the timetable for the fintech company to act is designed to be limited. There's not a steady state of always just playing. At some point, the fintech company needs to play for keeps. And either move on to obtain a license or from the perspective of the Bureau, allow the disclosure sandbox or the product sandbox to run its course in a manner that indicates that the underlying regulatory requirement could be modified so that the test results could be more broadly applicable. I think there's going to be challenges to the Bureau's sandbox program. I think that the state attorneys general, as well as the state banking agencies, will be lined up if an applicant shows up and obtains relief from an underlying statutory requirement, particularly some broad requirement that couples, say, a disclosure element of the Truth and Lending Act with a perceived action that is in violation of the prohibition against unfair or deceptive act or practices. And the Bureau, I believe, also is setting itself up for a, a challenge because if the information about the trial program in the sandbox that is, is designed to be closely held, then the relief that's given is going to not be consistent with the, some of the principles that are in the Administrative Procedure Act. To have the agency act in a manner that the other participants who are interested in the new rule can weigh in on, or that a reviewing court could, could take action on. And I think that the state attorneys general will seize on that. The other uh, risk, I think, to the Bureau's product sandbox is that the exemptions, that is, that the provisions of the Freedom of Information Act that permit the Bureau to withhold information might not be so well suited for conducting the trial program in the sandbox. Then I've offered a little chart here towards the end, or at the end, so that um, to get to the question raised in the course of the discussion, if a company really is planning to go forward, which sandbox program might be appropriate? And 
is there a, a way to begin to think about the potential costs? So I've sketched out a, a couple of the criteria here and drawn a few comparisons that um, we can borrow from and, and that each of you, if you wish to, can, can build on if you think that this is worthwhile. I think we're running towards the balance of the time, and if, I would love to hear questions if there are. Yet, or is this all still theoretical? Because it strikes me as extremely cumbersome for <coughs> enabling rapid innovation. Correct. So the question is, have any of these programs actually been applied or exploited in a way to promote innovation in financial products and services? And the answer is, in the United States, no. Contemplated that if a fintech company got an exemption or a waiver, that that would be a defense in private litigation as well. For instance, if there was a consumer action over the inadequacy of a disclosure, for instance, or so the question is whether the bureau contemplates in in either of its sandbox programs that the relief afforded to the fintech company also would operate as a bar against a claim made by a consumer in private litigation. And the answer is yes. Now, whether that has some stickiness is unclear. I think that the opportunity for the Bureau to preclude an action by a consumer is much stronger for the disclosure sandbox because the underlying authority for the Bureau under Section 1032E is straight away that the trial program may be limited in scope and grant, grant relief. But the interpretation that the Bureau has offered for those three statutory provisions is I think sufficiently shaky that notwithstanding its order granting the relief, I think the, the action still will be filed. Yes? So is there a requirement that if there is a, a product that's in the sandbox that there's clear disclosure to the consumer, hey, you're using a product that's in a sandbox? The question is whether there is a requirement in any one of these sandbox programs that the fintech company must provide to the consumer that the program or the, well, pardon me, the product or service or the element that is being delivered to the consumer is a function of a trial program and that the consumer is, is in a manner of speaking, a test subject. And the, the Bureau's proposals are unclear on that point. The, the, each of the Bureau's proposals does call for a general description of the fintech company that is acting in the sandbox program. So if a fintech company is going to offer a new disclosure for a trial period, then the Bureau will make that fact, that part, fact of participation publicly available. But I'd have to go back and check. My recollection is that no, there is not an explicit requirement for the fintech company to affirmatively <coughs> disclose to the consumer that this is a new or novel disclosure. In Arizona, yes, the answer is yes, that the, that the fintech company must alert the consumer who's obtaining the banking product or the sales finance product or the investment advisory product that the fintech company is offering this through the program offered by the Office of the Attorney General. Yes? Um, you mentioned that the UK program was quite successful. And I'm just, I didn't see anything specific that was so different that they were doing that we were doing. Is there something different about the UK market or the timing or the way the UK um, financial institutions are regulated that made them successful and basically no buyers on our side? The question is that I've observed that the, the program sponsored by the FCA in the UK appears to be more successful. And the question is, well, why? Why would the program in the UK be more successful? Uh, success in this, in this area, I believe, is described, at least by the Bureau, by the presence of applications and the willingness of fintech companies to make the commitment to overcome those costs to participate. And I believe that's, that's a fair way, at least initially, to, to assess whether the program might be successful. The reason I believe that the, uh, the program from the FCA is successful is that if a fintech company were to obtain that type of restricted authorization, 
that that would facilitate the entire process of obtaining the license in the UK, which then may operate as a passport to do business in the other jurisdictions of the EU, setting aside the, the back and forth with Brexit. But consider that these programs were developed before the summer of 2016. And so a fintech company looking ahead to a market that's, in, that's broad and that must admit a licensed firm that is licensed in a member state, that's a pretty big payoff. And that's a payoff that currently a fintech company that seeks to be a money transmitter may not obtain by going through the program in Arizona. There's no assurance that that license obtained in Arizona is going to qualify in Texas or California or Illinois and so on. All right, thank you. Thank you all of you.